Hey Saints and happy December. I pray that you are looking forward to this month as much as I do. It's a fabulous month. It happens to be the birthday month for several people in my family, including my wife Susan and our younger son Santiago. Uh, it is also the month where we find ourselves in the midst of Advent, where we get Christmas, New Year's Eve, so lots of great things happening this month. And towards the end of this month, uh, the days start getting longer, so everybody wins. And everybody wins as we continue to read our scriptures. But now, I'm not here to talk about December, but rather November, our previous month's Bible reading. And it was a pretty awesome month of Bible reading. So let me jump right in. Uh, we started off at the beginning of November, Luke 19. And Luke 19 is a pretty awesome chapter. You know, it's Jesus getting off to a really good start because we have the story of Jesus and Zacchaeus, you know, that short little tax collector uh, who ends up turning his life around. And then he follows us up with his triumphal entry into Jerusalem. And so you know, things started off so promising. You know, if we hadn't read the Gospels previous to this, we might think that, you know, Jesus might ride in into Jerusalem and just run everything, and that things would go really well. But then Jesus did something that at least in my opinion, wasn't so smart. He cleansed the temple. And so you see, you know, he gave them a reason to start being mad at him. So why did he waste all of those good feels? That's a question to ask him in heaven. Uh, Luke 20 and 21, we have some more parables and teachings. Uh, the passion, according to Luke, begins on chapter 22, and it begins in full force. We have the Lord's Supper. Um, one thing I love about the passion, according to Luke, is there's even more drama. And so there's an exchange where Jesus tells them, unlike in other gospels, that, you know what? You do need a person. You do need a sword to the point where they say, hey, we have a couple swords here. And he's like, yeah, that's enough. So that's already kind of hilarious. And then in this version, Peter's denial of Jesus happens. And you know, in cinematic perfection, as soon as that denial happens and the cock crows, Jesus turns around and looks at him. And so it's pretty awesome. And so definitely get down with that passion according to Luke. Luke 23, Jesus dies, he's crucified and dies. And then 24, he's raised from the dead. And we have the famous road to Emmaus story, um, along with his appearance before the apostles. And so that's the gospel according to Luke. Uh, my favorite gospel, as I've said again and again and again, y'all are tired of that, but it's all good. And then we have the gospel according to John, uh, which is Anderson's favorite gospel and probably the favorite gospel of several of the rest of you. We start at John 1, and it says, in the beginning. So let me say a word about this. Uh, this is the last of the gospels. And so we can think about when do the gospels begin telling the story, especially begin telling the story of Jesus's lineage. And so in Matthew's gospel, it starts at Abraham. Pretty cool. Um, Mark doesn't bother with that. He's like, whatever, who cares? Uh, Luke goes all the way back to Adam. And so we see this interesting contrast where, you know, Matthew places him very much uh, as a part of that ancestry and the connection to all the Jews. By going back to Adam, Luke places it very much as part of the ancestry and connection to all humanity. And then we have John, who starts in the beginning, as in in the beginning of time or before the beginning of time. So that's pretty cool. But then John kind of does a reversal because then he starts all the way in the beginning of time and then like Mark skips right to Jesus baptism by the end of the first chapter of John Jesus already has his first couple of disciples called um, hits the ground running <laughs> in John 2 we get the wedding at Cana and so this is actually really significant because in much of the church especially in the Episcopal and the Roman Catholic Church one of the arguments one of the principal arguments for marriage being a sacrament of the church even though it actually started outside the church was that Jesus ordained this way of life through his first miracle at the wedding of Cana. And this is a place where I totally agree with John because, you know, I think that this was the perfect first miracle of Jesus. Um, Jesus for sure would have attended, you know, a wedding with his family. You know, at that point, uh, his father Joseph was already dead. And so he probably uh, accompanied his mom to the wedding and everything like that. And so I totally believe that this happened. And I think that this was a great first miracle of Jesus. Uh, and then later on that chapter, he messes with all the fields by cleansing the temple. Um, we note that in all the other gospel passages where we talk about Jesus cleansing the temple, it's towards the end, you know, sort of said as, okay, this probably led to him getting killed. Whereas in John's gospel, he starts off that way. John 3, we have Jesus and Nicodemus, including uh, many of the famous teachings, including John 3, 16, that I'm sure many of you could recite. Uh, For God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. Uh, that is the King James Version. There are other words that you can use with other versions as well. 
um, John 4, uh, Jesus and the Samaritan woman. And so one thing we see about John is that uh, he dives right into the gospel and it's boom, 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 boom. There's not a lot of downtime. Uh, John 6, feeding the 5,000, walking on water. And then on 9, uh, John 9, we have this whole saga around the man born blind who receives a sight. Um, if you're sort of feeling deja vu with this story, that's because uh, this a couple weeks ago, or a little bit more than a couple weeks ago, we spent several Sundays reading this particular gospel passage a little bit week by week. Uh, what happens? Jesus heals a man born blind. Uh, this is a really, really big deal. He did it on the Sabbath. That's a big deal. Um, and at the heart of this is this huge discourse um, between Jesus and some of the Jewish leadership at the time. I think what we see is that John's gospel, um, having been written later, and especially after the, the Jewish Christians separated more fully from uh, the non-Christian Jews, that uh, much of that drama, much of that dis disagreement about who Jesus was is played out in this gospel. And so we see this especially in chapter 9. Uh, we get Lazarus um, in chapter 11 with that famous shortest, uh, shortest verse of the whole Bible, verse 35, where it says, Jesus wept. Um, I'm going to complain about this a little bit. <laughs> when Jesus started crying, they said, see how he loved him. And yeah, I get it. You know, that makes sense. But I look at it this way. You know, you don't have to cry to show people that you love them. And, you know, when Jesus was raising people from the dead and feeding them and doing all this other great stuff, they never said anything about how much he loved them. And so I get mad about that because, you know, I think, I don't know, if you're a human, you don't cry a lot and people think you don't care. But whatever, I digress. So John 13, uh, we have the foot washing, uh, which some, including Jehovah's Witnesses, celebrate as the only sacrament that Jesus truly commanded us to do. Um, then there's lots of chapters about Jesus talking about himself. Not my favorite, but we have some pretty exciting ones. Good Shepherd, all that fun stuff. Uh, we go to um, all the way to John 18, where the passion begins, according to John. Um, there's This is where that discussion between Jesus and Pilate uh, is its most epic. Uh, and it ends with Pilate asking Jesus, what is truth? So that's really cool. Um, John 19, we have the crucifixion. Um, 20, we have later in 19, we have the resurrection. We have the Doubting Thomas story. Um, lots of great stuff. And then at the end of the Gospel of John, we have that story of Jesus and Peter where he says, do you love me? And he asks him three times, kind of making up for the three denials. Um, and he tells Peter that he's going to die a horrible death. There we are. And that's John's Gospel. Uh, we then leave the Gospels and read Acts of the Apostles. Um, a couple things to highlight from Acts of the Apostles. Uh, so Acts 1 um, is some housekeeping. We have the Ascension story again because it was already in Luke. Um, and then we also have Matthias chosen to fill out the 12. Here we get a different version of the way that Judas died. And so um, in the gospel account of his death, uh, Judas hung himself. Um, in the Acts account, uh, the way they say it, and I'll just quote them, uh, he fell headlong and his, his middle split open and his guts spilled out. Um, Honestly, that sounds a lot more painful, uh, but there we are. Um, Acts chapter 2, we have the story of the Pentecost, and here we see the Holy Spirit showing up in a different way. Now, many people think, oh, this is when the Holy Spirit first showed up. It is not when the Holy Spirit first showed up. The Holy Spirit was there at creation. There are tons of stories where we hear about the Spirit. So, so don't be one of those Christians who's like, it showed up on Acts 2. All right, next up, we have uh, Acts 3, where Peter and John cre uh, healed the crippled beggar. And so we get this sense, okay, they have it now. Those healing powers that were just with Jesus, they're now clearly with the apostles. Um, Acts 4 and 5, we hear about those early Christians in these communities that grew really greatly. Believers sharing possessions, including a story of folks holding back possessions in Ananias and Sapphira and uh, paying the ultimate price for it. Uh, the deacons are chosen in, in Acts 6. Uh, we have Stephen, uh, his emergence, and then his stoning as Stephen became the first martyr in chapter 7. And here at the end of chapter 7, Saul... Um, Saul of Tarsus, uh, persecutor of the church, emerges. Um, Acts 8, we get the Ethiopian eunuch, uh, which is significant uh, because here uh, we know uh, for a fact that there are churches that are continuous from this engagement between Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch um, that are alive today. And so the oldest continuous Christian churches um, come out of Acts chapter 8. Um, and then Acts chapter 9, Saul is converted to Paul. He becomes Christian. Um, we fast forward a little bit, Acts chapter 12, um, St. James, also known as Santiago, is killed. He's the first of the apostles um, who was martyred, which is pretty significant. Um, and then much of the rest of the book of Acts um, mainly follows Paul uh, and his adventures and his 
work and his agreements and his disagreements, eventually his imprisonment and this whole saga around him appealing to the emperor. Uh, it's fairly interesting. Um, and then we end Acts chapter 27 and 28. Um, skip to the end if you need to. There's a shipwreck. Um, Paul is on the ship and he's taken, uh, going to be taken somewhere and um, it's shipwrecks and he says this is what's going to happen. And then, he's on that, uh, and then there's a snake on the island of Malta. Malta is really cool. I actually know some Maltese people. Um, very fascinating. But anyway, he's on the island of Malta. And what happens is that there's a fire. They gather around a fire. It's cold. And uh, there's a snake. And it attaches itself to his hand. And, and a lot of the natives on Malta were like, yo, this bro, <laughs> he must have done something real bad. And, and, and justice has found him. But he ends up um, being totally fine uh, for having been bitten by the snake. And so that's Acts of the Apostles. Next, we have the book of Romans. And so this is where we shift pretty greatly because, you know, before now, everything has been very narrative based where now we get deeply theological. Um, the first seven chapters of Roman talk a lot about being justified by faith, which is a really important concept and how God's grace uh, goes to those who are faithful. And so this centers faith as opposed to the law, as opposed to works. Um, Romans 8 is one that captures the heart of many, uh, many spiritual champions have cited Romans 8 as the one that warmed their heart and uh, and got them to commit to God in a new way. Uh, if, in my opinion, I think the true goal in Romans is between Romans chapter 12 and 14, just tons of teachings about Christian life. And so, you know, there this isn't meant to be a systematic uh, description of what it means to live as a Christian. And um, if you wanted to read something like that, the book of Romans, and in my opinion, uh, chapters 8 and then 12 to 14, would be a really great place to start. And so that's Paul's letter to the Romans. And then uh, towards the end of November, we begin the letter, uh, the first letter to the Corinthians. And it's the beginning of several letters where Paul essentially is kind of mad <laughs> at these people to whom he's writing the letter. And um, Corinthians will get better um, as we start reading it in December. So that is it. That is everything. It's been quite the month of Bible reading. I hope you've enjoyed it all. And uh, yeah, I look forward to seeing you soon.